It's been a year since this course came out, and in that time, almost 2,000 people have taken it. But what I really want to show is just some examples of cool work people have done where they've taken exactly what you've learned in this course. I mean, literally, to a line, they, they, they took the same course, and then they kept going with the same fundamentals that we talked about. In many cases, even building off the Warrior Legend series of exercises in code that you've seen. Now, the context for these examples, I just want to be clear where they're coming from. Uh, I've started a club called Gam Keto Club. It's people who make games together on the internet worldwide. Uh, but these are some of the practice projects that some of the people in our club have led and done together. So one of the first ones that really uses this kind of technology and technique, and you can see here some examples. This is called Ant Venture. It's a game led by Henry Shotwell. But it's it's using, the obviously, the, it combined at first the platform jumping code from the end of the course along with the scrolling code that allowed you to have slightly bigger areas. And it's a game you can see some simple enemy mechanics of enemies moving around. The player character can pick up and move these columns, which generally were rocks, to get around. And when you fall off the bottom of the screen, we go to a new area. And part of what's so cool about this game is that you can pick up a map, and it's a huge world. So this U right there represents where you are in the world. See, there's just vastly different zones all around the place where there's a boss battle, there's different puzzles to solve. What I like about this, right, is it's not adding even a whole lot of art. It's got a little bit of art on top, but it's not a ton of it. Like the, the we've got these soft mold tiles. You can't put the, the weights, the, the columns on. And uh, we've got these spiky tiles that'll kill you. Oh, here's another thing they added. Uh, we've got torches in the background, but these doors, we can use them to jump from one door to another. I also want to show real quick the, uh, the boss fight, which I'm going to cheat real quick to get to. Boom. And I thought this was really awesome where uh, for the final boss fight room, let me jump up here, get the ice block, freeze the bad guy. We've got this giant enemy queen and I can get the crown. I think I should have kept my freeze power there. You can see there's a sword up there. I get it and I attack the queen. I'll let you find that for yourself when you play Ant Venture. But that's what, part of what happened for the project was on this team, Charlie Volpe designed a level editor. And this actually, he used a different approach to programming this in terms of like, this isn't even on canvas. But he built a level editor where we can just navigate freely with our keys between the rooms. And so this allowed more people on the team to make these rooms for the visual layout where they didn't have to be thinking about, okay, uh, zero was an empty space, one was a dirt tile, two was a moving block, whatever. He just built this editor and that allowed us to, to speed up and distribute better the task on our team of defining these level spaces and building these puzzles out. Now, another project that used the same kind of stuff you've seen in this course, this game's called uh, Hungry Game. It's led by Jeremy Kenyon. And it's a, it's a game which you're a post-apocalyptic pizza delivery guy. So you can see I get some pizzas and it shows there on top left, I've got pizza icons to deliver. And, uh, and, and in this game, you're just going from zone to zone delivering pizzas. One of the effects I really like added to this game, in addition you saw on the first screen, this kind of a store, kind of a Zelda-like arrangement, is that it's got this scrolling transition between zones. And it's kind of like old Zelda did, right? Where it's just like scrolling one zone to the next. It's, it's a little less jarring. It helps you have a better sense of the continuity of the space. Uh, I think it adds a lot. On top of, again, this is based on the exact same kind of code, literally the same code you've done in this course. Now, another example, this is actually led by the same project lead, Jeremy Kenyon. This one's called Little Brother. And uh, it's just a match three tile game. Right, I mean, but where this started was Jeremy took that chess project that I kind of showed an example of like a board game type interaction and he made it so, okay, so instead of being able to move a chess piece anywhere, if you can only move it to an adjacent tile and then when you move it, it switches the tile value there, that's what he did in order to get this working so you could do some match three stuff. Of course, we wrote a little simple algorithm to scan the grid and determine where there's three in a row, but it's based on the exact same kind of 2D tile-based dynamics plus that mouse interaction that you saw there for the chess type board type of game. Uh, this is one of the more recent games. Uh, this one's led by Casper. And this one also uses that tile based stuff in addition to some, some more advanced enemy spawning and particle effect systems. I think this level might, oh no, there we go with some planets. And you see these walls on the edges that are kind of defining, I'm trying to race ahead. I'm gonna take some serious damage. Oop. <laughs> There we go. And you can see there's some zones out here that define boundaries and barriers and obstacles. There's a boss fight added. But underneath all this, detecting the collision for the, the shots against the walls, the player against the walls, bam, 
is that exact same tile-based system. Now, one of the other changes that Casper's team made for this project, notice how these tiles, they show corners, they show bottoms, they show flat edges and so on. What makes that possible is after we just designed the level by just placing zeros and ones, the game when it starts reads through that and looks and sees, okay, which walls are connected in which directions from other walls? And then it picks the appropriate graphical tile to show in that position out of a graphic that another person on the team set up. I'm gonna show you that graphic real quick. All right, so here's our tile map. And this is something that was, the graphics here were designed by Noah, one of our club members or C colon games. And you can see how it's sort of different versions of tiles based on if it stands alone, it uses this. If it's a inside corner or outside corner or an end piece or a horizontal or vertical, then it has different mappings it uses for the tile. That's part of what was built into this extension of the, of the engine for this space shooter Casper led. Now, lastly, there is one of our current games. This one's super duper early. This one's being led by Oasis. Very early build here. But it's a it's a haunted house game. Uh, most of the art is now currently placeholder in terms of what's why the rooms are so pink and yellow and whatever. But it's a mansion. Uh, it's going to become a haunted house mansion. And this is like the stairwell. So when we go through the stairs and we come back up, now we're on the second floor. Notice this room's blue. I go down the stairs. Now we are on the first floor, which is yellow. And, and in that simple little bit of code there, we detect, you know, are you in the stairs room? Where are you walking off the edge? We created an entire second floor to give this house additional space for then putting out some of our puzzles and our gating mechanisms and our player powers and our enemies and characters. In terms of what those might look like, I mean, for the first part, we have some early enemies here. This is a sliding environment. These are This is early placeholder ice. But you notice when I move my character, I can't turn anymore. I lose control of it. In order to get control, I have to pick up the spiky boots. And when I have the spiky boots, you can see my inventory down there. I can now walk on the ice. Another kind of gating we have in this game is that we have like, there's a dark room. I can't go in, it's too dark, I can't see. It won't let me go further inside. But if I go over here and I get the flashlight, I take my flashlight and now I can enter the room and see just fine. As well as all of these down here are basically just, just lock and key puzzles where there's a red door, yellow door, green and so on. But to open it, I have to find the matching key. So a green key will let me open green doors, red key to open green do red doors. And we're probably gonna replace more of those with symbolic things. So like here we have like a door with a chain on it and to open it, we can use a crowbar to break the chain. We have some animated sprites up here for enemies. Those of course are currently stationary because literally got added this morning. Another thing about how this game works that I think might be of interest to people out there, there's another technique in your tool belt is it's using what some people call pixel doubling. It's really pixel quadrupling here where the entire game is really being drawn to a much smaller canvas, about one quarter this size. Kind of simulate the actual size it is. Early on in the game's code, it's drawing it all first to a very small buffer, about this size. And then as the final step in the draw code, it's taking that small buffer and stretching it in a way that we've done a few different CSS flags and internal settings to make sure it doesn't blur at all and just keeps its per pixel precision. And a nice thing about this, right, is that it means that all of our graphics are now 14 by 14 pixel tiles, which means it's much easier to stick to a really clean retro aesthetic. It's really simple for us to iterate on our animations, to make things symmetrical, to make things match. Uh, it results in much less data overall to download, so it's a smaller program size. Lots of little advantages, especially for a beginning practice project, to using smaller shrunk graphics and then pixel doubling or pixel quadrupling. So anyway, that's just a handful of the, the some of the 2D projects that we've seen come out of people who literally as their springboard to right after they took this course, you, now within Gamkito Club, they're applying it to build a game with a team of other members and creating an experience that's quite different from what you first saw in terms of the Warrior Legend kind of game. So anyway, that's, that's all I have for now for this update. Uh, I want to thank everyone who's taken this course and been a part of it. I think it's been super awesome. The results I've been seeing people make out of this. I've seen other examples too that I can't even show here just because they're some cases, private training clients as opposed to club members. And they've done things like they've made war-based games where you, you know, you have an inventory and you have ammunition and you have resources to then buy up and place units for a strategy game and all kinds of cool stuff come out of this. But but uh, I, I really look forward to seeing and playing the kind of games you're going to build with it. I, I thank you so much for taking the course. Uh, yeah, that's it now for the update.